Greetings from Bronx, New York. This is Ronald Wharton. I am a cardiologist at Montefiore Medical Center and assistant professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. And this is a short little vignette, but I thought something that was uh, educational and may be useful to you out in everyday practice. I call it a differential diagnosis. You'll see why. So here's the history. This is a 60-year-old woman who had actually been sent out from another emergency department uh, within the previous week before she had come to Montefiore because of symptoms of shortness of breath, maybe some vague chest pains. Uh, when she came to our emergency department, she had had a syncopal episode and she'd been complaining of some shortness of breath. wasn't exactly clear how long this had been going on for. And as usual, an echocardiogram is obtained. And here's a parasternal long axis, the very first image. Um, I think you would agree, as you see everything playing, that the left ventricle looks normal, grossly the mitral and aortic valves look normal, and the right ventricle looks, I think, reasonably good here. I don't think there's anything terribly outlandish that you could say, you know, point to something and say, oh, there's something really, really wrong here. If we look at the um, apical four-chamber view, similarly, I'm not exactly sure you would say that anything is really wrong. The LV looks like it's squeezing pretty well. Um, the RV size is probably normal, probably normal function. Nothing terribly, or at least no, nothing overtly obvious, at least to my eye. In the next slide, you see an apical two-chamber view. And again, the LV function looks very, very robust. As an aside, her initial cardiac markers uh, when she came to the hospital were oral, normal. Although I think all of us in clinical practice know that you can never hang your hat on just one set of blood tests, but at least the first set was all normal. So, any thoughts so far? Any obvious abnormalities? Well, to me, the left ventricle looked okay, and to me, the right ventricle, looking at this, looked pretty good too. So, let's put some color on. We now have the parasternal long axis with color. There is no aortic regurgitation. There's no mitral regurgitation. The valves, as you know, looked like they were opening normally, and certainly on the color flow, that's confirmed. There's no turbulence to suggest that there's any valvular stenosis. The flow in the left ventricular outflow tract looks laminar. There's no turbulence in the little part of the right ventricular outflow tract that we can see. So here's now the RV inflow view with color. And what do we see? Well, there's a TR jet probably in the vicinity of moderate, looks too much to be mild, doesn't look severe enough to be severe, so I end up calling it moderate. That's my algorithm. I think a lot of echocardiographers use that as moderate TR. That surprised me when I came to this view. When I first saw this image, I wasn't expecting that. And in the next slide, you can see that the TR jet has a velocity of about 3.3 meters per second or a gradient of about 44 millimeters of mercury, you know, with a right atrial pressure that's relatively normal, you can estimate that the PA pressure is somewhere in the low 50s, suggests the presence of mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension. Is that all we can glean from this slide? Is there anything else we can suggest? You know, we see that there's pulmonary hypertension. Obviously, there's always some alarms that go off when we see that finding. But the RV, to me, looked like it was pretty normal. At least I thought so. Here's something that you may want to consider doing when you're on the fence about whether or not you should call the right ventricle normal or perhaps mildly abnormal or suggest that there might be some right ventricular systolic dysfunction. And nowadays, I think in the echo community, we're starting to focus more and more on the right ventricle, possibly because we've already beaten the left ventricle to death. What I did here was show you the slope of the TR jet between one and two meters per second. Why between one and two meters per second? Because that allows us to look at the right ventricular systolic function in the isovolumic contraction period before the pulmonic valve is opened. We do this all the time on the left side of the heart, but we use the parameters one meter per second to three meter per second because the isovolumic contraction period on the left ventricle on the left side would extend through that period. But obviously on the right side of the heart where the pressures are lower, by the time the TR jet hits three meters per second, the pulmonic valve is already opened and we're no longer looking at a measure of intrinsic right ventricular contractility independent of the RV afterload. So we hear you can see that it takes about 50 milliseconds for the TR jet to get from one meter per second to two meters per second. 
What does that calculate to? Well, that calculates to a derivative of 240 millimeters of mercury per second. That's just four times the quantity V1 squared minus V2 squared divided by the amount of time that it took. It's a derivative. And this allows us, as I said, to get a very nice quantitative, reproducible, objective measure of RV contractility. In 2010, when guidelines were last published on the quantitative assessment of the right ventricle, there's a quote that says very clearly that the TRDPDT can be considered abnormal if it's anything less than 400 millimeters per second. Or in other words, the jet between one meter per second and two meters per second should not take more than 30 milliseconds to get there, and here it took 50 milliseconds. So there it is, in fact, RV dysfunction. So when you first look at the 2D images on this echo, you think, you know, this isn't really so bad. But when you look at it closely, you see that there's mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension, and there is, in fact, some RV systolic dysfunction. If you look again at the uh, apical four chamber images, you know, I was sort of on the fence as to what I would call the RV, but with the derivative of the TPTT jet being what it is, I was comfortable calling mild RV dysfunction here. And ultimately, in fact, this patient had multiple small pulmonary emboli on a CT scan. So the reason I call this a differential diagnosis is because I like calculus. <laughs> and it was actually using a derivative that helps quantify exactly what's going on with the right ventricle here. And perhaps we can integrate this more into our practice. In any case, a small case, but I thought I learned a lot from it, and I hope you do too. This is Ron Wharton from the Bronx, New York, for theheart.org on Medscape Cardiology, and thanks for tuning in.